GC 90.7's Studio A on the campus of Gulf Coast State College. Rap Line with Emily Blaze. And on this very special edition of Rap Line, we are on location at Gulf World Marine Institute and we're going to learn all about the nonprofit institute and how they help injured uh, mammals, turtles, dolphins. With me right now is Stephanie Nagel. She is the education coordinator for Gulf World Marine Institute. Stephanie, thanks for taking time out of your day. Thank you. And so basically, um, give us an overview of the Institute. A lot of people, of course, are familiar with the um, park, mm -hmm. but there's an Institute here as well. So tell me about the Institute. Well, the Institute was developed a few years ago, and we are a nonprofit. And what we do is rescue, rehabilitate, and release injured marine animals. So that will include sea turtles, dolphins, and small whales. So um, take me through uh, the, the process. How does, how does the Institute get notified that there is an injured dolphin, turtle, what have you, and then what happens after that? The first thing what we do is get notified by phone, of course, and usually it's people that are walking along the beach and they stumble upon this animal. And the best thing to do, of course, is call local officials. And usually people will dial Florida Fish and Wildlife and they'll eventually get a hold of us or they can call us directly. We do have an option on our main line that prompts to who to call if they do find an injured animal. And the best thing to do when that person finds that animal is to stay by the animal. If there's any suggestions from the other person from Gulf World that's on the line, they can mention a few things, just make sure the animal's nice and calm before help arrives. So it's best to call for help before they do anything. And so um, in general, what, what type of animals are you getting the most of here in the Institute? We get a lot of sea turtles. And it depends during the year. Uh, so far this year, we've gotten um, about a little over 10, just general strandings of sea turtles. Uh, we get a lot of sea turtles when it comes to uh, the month of December and January. Kind of into February, we get cold stun sea turtles. And in those times, we can get hundreds of sea turtles. Uh, they come in mass strandings because the temperatures around here get pretty cold mm -hmm. in shallow waters and it shocks those animal systems. And they will come in for rehabilitation and then we'll eventually release them. But we've been known to get quite a few. Um, by quite a few, I mean a couple hundred or more. Back in 2010, we actually had 1,800 sea turtles here on property. <laughs> So it could depend um, on the year, how many sea turtles we get. If they're not cold stunned sea turtles, we usually get turtles that come in, um, they might have pneumonia or they usually get fishing gear wrapped around them. Monofilament is um, a major injury that they'll come in with and we'll treat that and then release them as well. And so uh, are there uh, animals or a particular animal that really stands out in your mind um, and kind of tell us that story and, and what eventually happened to that animal? Well, there's one in particular right now that's intriguing me. Um, we have a sea turtle from the Georgia Sea Turtle Center that was transported down here. Um, they moved her down here because they wanted her to swim in a deeper habitat because they want to make sure she can forage um, and dive. She actually has an amputated flipper so she has three flippers right now um, and they want to make sure that she can swim properly before she's released. And she has a lot of fans up in Georgia. She actually has um, over a thousand adoptive parents, basically means that they're um, keeping in touch with her, donating to her progress. So um, it's pretty cool to be able to be a part of that and help with that rehabilitation. And it's also neat that more facilities are working together to help you know release these animals it's not just one facility we're all working together and she's doing very well and she should be released soon and so do we know why she's missing a flipper um i believe it was monofilament okay so um, fishing line again fishing, yes and we might need to ask dr stags that too right right yeah so so I would imagine that um, people listening to this and watching this are thinking, wow, Stephanie Nagel's job sounds like a lot of fun. So um, what is some of the best part of your day here at Gulf World? It depends. Um, my day varies 
tremendously. It depends when I wake up on the day what's going to happen. Um, you never know when you're going to get a stranded animal. They're very sporadic. So you could wake up one day and there could be an injured dolphin on the beach and you have to take it back here for rehabilitation. Uh, the difference with the turtle rehabilitation and dolphin is that dolphin rehabilitation requires 24-hour care. So there always has to be here someone taking care of the animal because um, when they do strand, they're very weak and we want to make sure that we're in the habitat with the animal helping it um, get better. So it's a little bit more involved when you're dealing with dolphins. So that could take a lot of time out of your day. Even turtles do take time out of your day too. And, but at the same time, it's very exciting. And of course, it's very rewarding when you get to release these turtles too. And I guess, is that the goal of the Institute is, is to eventually release these animals? Yes, yes. We're, that's our main goal, to release the animals. There are some times where we can't release the animal. We do a work under the National Marine Fisheries Service and also Florida Fish and Wildlife. And they partner, well, we work underneath them. So they will let us know if we can release the animals or not. Our veterinarian will talk with them and if everything's okay to release the animal, we go ahead. Sometimes there are cases where we cannot release the animal. Um, if they have pretty severe injuries, we cannot release them. We do have some dolphins, um, some of our rough tooth dolphins. We could not release them because they had hearing impairments. So releasing them could definitely be um, severe to their health and they probably wouldn't survive in their natural habitat. And so they were deemed not releasable and they're staying here now with us. You are listening and watching Rap Line here on GC 90.7 FM and GC TV. And we're on location today at Gulf World Marine Institute on Panama City Beach. And my guest right now, Stephanie Nagel, she is the education coordinator for the Institute and for the park. So Stephanie, what should someone do if they happen upon a turtle or a dolphin who seems to be in distress? The best thing to do is to call um, officials. So officials meaning Florida Fish and Wildlife or Gulf World. And if they do call Gulf World directly, we do have a prompt that tells you which number to call. And it's a 24 hour hotline, so we will answer at any time. Sometimes we do have animals stranding at one o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. So we're available and we're um, able to respond at any time of the day. And while we're coming out there to respond, the best thing to do is to leave the animal alone, try not to touch it, especially if they're very weak, they could be very scared. So it is important to stay by the animal to make sure that you have a good location to give to us and making sure the animal is okay at the time. Sometimes we do prompt people over the phone and to help us if, especially if it's a dolphin. Um, if it's a stranded dolphin and it's a very sunny day, dolphins can actually get sunburned. So the best thing to do is if you have a beach umbrella to put it over the dolphin and shade the dolphin or if you have a beach towel, you can put the beach towel over the body of the dolphin. Just make sure that you don't cover up the blowhole. And the number one thing to do if you ever see a stranded dolphin or a beach dolphin is to never push it back. Um, a lot of times people think it's okay to push animals back, they think they're stuck. Mm -hmm. um, but when dolphins do strand, they're actually very weak and so it's best to leave them there until help arrives. And um, what do you think are some of the more surprising things that our viewers and listeners uh, might find out about working with the Institute or the stranded animals? What are some surprising things? Ooh, surprise. I, I think people don't realize when you work with especially a stranded dolphin that it's 24-hour care mm. and it's very exciting to rescue a dolphin but also very tiring. <laughs> it's one of those um, situations where you feel so grateful to help this animal but at the same time you're a little exhausted. Mm. <laughs> uh, we take shifts of course. There are four-hour shifts if we have a live dolphin in rehabilitation and it's you have to stay in the habitat with the dolphin and hold it up because they're so weak at times. So it's um, you need a lot of strength too, <laughs> and you need to uh, be able to be on call as well. It's kind of an on call situation. You know, if it's one o'clock in the morning, you get a call, you have to immediately change and run out to um, the area where that animal is. So. It's, um, that's probably one of the things when I started working mm -hmm. with the Institute that you realize that you have to 
um, react very quickly and um, coffee would help too. Coffee. <laughs> yes. Now, when we're talking about dolphins, you know, um, they can be a large animal. So mm -hmm. what are we talking about generally, um, weight size and, and how many of you does it take to get that animal, that mammal off the beach and into the truck and back here to Gulf World? It depends on how big the animal is. Sometimes we do respond to calves, and those guys could be anywhere from 25 to 50 pounds, still a little heavy, uh, but we, of course, need a couple people for that. Usually when we hear of a stranded dolphin, we try to get as many people as possible. And we do have stretchers, so that definitely helps. Uh, we put the animal on the stretcher, we could have maybe five to six people at the most. Um, some standby uh, beachgoers might be able to help us too if we need extra muscle, so that's always exciting for them. But these animals could be anywhere from 500 to 800 pounds. We recently had a very unusual animal that stranded. We usually don't see in this area. It was a beaked whale and this animal was well over probably a thousand pounds and so we definitely needed more assistance for that too. So. It, it varies, but most of the time if we ever get a call for an injured dolphin, they're gonna be about 500 pounds. So you definitely need a lot of people. Sea turtles, on the other hand, a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. You might just have one person responding or a couple, depending on how big the sea turtle is as well. Now, Stephanie, you just mentioned um, one of the more unusual animals, a whale, and that's something that we certainly um, don't hear about a lot of here on Panama City Beach is a whale. So tell me a little bit more about that whale and where do we think it may have migrated from? Well, this is an offshore species, so we don't know. Um, they're, they're found in the Gulf and other places too, but usually offshore species of course don't come into the shallow waters. So we knew this animal was injured and definitely weak, so that's why it stranded itself. Um, but it was very unusual to see because we usually don't see them around here and it's been years and years until we've seen another one. So uh, it was very unique and very exciting for everyone. Um, it's, it's definitely a unique sight to see because we usually see bottlenose dolphins, spotted dolphins, sometimes rough toothed dolphins. So seeing this beaked whale, we got excited for kind of like giddy schoolgirls, you know, <laughs> when we got to see it. So we usually get those animals in very sporadically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do get pilot whales, melon headed whales, or another um, animal that we receive. We don't really receive any of the larger whales that people associate with, like humpback whales. Those would be more on the Atlantic coast but never say never. <laughs> right. um, but usually we'll get animals that are between 10 to 15 feet at the most. And uh, you mentioned the cold stun turtles and uh, how sometimes you can have hundreds at a time. So um, what kind of manpower does that take um, when you're responding to a bunch of t sea turtles that are cold stunned? Can coffee be a manpower? <laughs> um, with our cold stuns, we definitely start uh, reaching out to different people, not only with Gulf World, but there are other people that step in and offer their time. We have a group that we work with, the St. Andrew, St. Andrew's Turtle Watch, mm -hmm. and there's some volunteers that help us with that as well. With those sea turtles, especially back in 2010 when we received the 1800, there would be truckloads of hundreds of sea turtles in coming each day. So what we had to do is actually shut off certain parts of the park. Uh, most of our rehabilitation takes back behind the scenes where no one really sees it's nice and quiet for the animals, but for this case we had to shut down some habitats, move those animals out and put sea turtles in. So. I've, I wasn't here for that time, but I have seen pictures, and it was just, instead of Gulf World, it should have been named Turtle World. <laughs> um, but we did receive some help from other facilities, and they took some turtles from us, but we had the bulk of those animals. And with cold sun sea turtles, when they do come in, we want to make sure we gradually warm them up. And once they start becoming a little bit more active, we put them in some of our habitats in the back where uh, one of our pools, or a couple of our pools, I should say. And then we're able to release them pretty quickly after that, once we make sure they regain their strength. For that, uh, the Coast Guard actually helped us out, and we put hundreds of turtles on a huge ship, and they took them offshore a couple miles. So uh, it was a big production, but very, very successful as well. 
So Stephanie, what kind of advice would you have for someone who wants to um, work in this, in this marine environment? The best thing to do is volunteering. That's my number one tip. Volunteering or internships, just getting your foot in the door and getting that hands-on experience. Um, it's best to, of course, get a college degree. Most of the time, people that want to work in the rehabilitation field will get a degree in biology or um, pre-med, things like that to help them, or a kind of a vet tech mm -hmm. degree as well. So that will help them a little bit more with the more intensive rehabilitation on the medication or the fluids to give animals. Uh, but definitely the most important thing I would say is volunteering and internships. The more experience you have, the more employers are gonna look at that and see that's gonna be easier, we can get your foot in the door, you can help us a little bit quicker, and we don't. Um, well, I would say it's more on the job training mm -hmm. more than um, studying, but it's very important to know your basics and know what you're doing with these animals. And uh, finally, I wanted to uh, discuss one of the most recent uh, releases you had. Um, I believe it was Denise mm -hmm. release. So tell me a little bit about Denise's story, her injuries, and um, a little bit about the rehab. Denise was found in the Destin area, and when she came in, she was very weak, um, and she was a little skinny, and we ran some tests on her, and she was actually anemic. So after a little bit of treatment, uh, we have a resident veterinarian here, and after that treatment, and she was only here for about three weeks, we were able to release her back into her natural habitat. So that was a pretty quick release for her and quick rehabilitation. And sometimes it varies. Some turtles are here for a few months, some are here for a year or two. So she was definitely a quick rehabilitation case. And uh, as we're wrapping up, is there anything else that you want our listeners and viewers to know that we didn't talk about today? If they are interested in learning more information about the Institute, we do have a website and that is gulfworldmarineinstitute.org. And we have a blog on there too, so we're always updating new stories, new patients that we have arriving. And there's also a little bit more information about our past patients too. So it's a great website to look at. Um, we hopefully will have a volunteer base growing soon. So that's probably another um, resource you can look at if you need to find more information there. Okay, wonderful, Stephanie. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day and Thank telling you. us about the Institute. Thanks. And that is a discussion with Stephanie Nagel. Again, she is the Education Coordinator here at Gulf World Marine Institute. And in just a few minutes, we're going to talk to the veterinarian on staff here as well. So again, on location here at uh, Gulf World Marine Institute on Panama City Beach, and joining me right now is Dr. Lydia Staggs. She is the staff veterinarian for the Institute and for Gulf World Marine Park. So welcome to the show. Thanks for Thank talking you. to us. Thank you very much. So um, first off, I understand that um, you're busy working with um, a stranded dolphin that you just received in. What can you tell me about that? Yes, we have a, a newly stranded uh, dolphin that came in last night and it is a female bottlenose dolphin. She is a juvenile, which means um, she's not a calf. She's a little bit older, but she's approximately, we think about two years of age um, based on her weight and her length. And so she stranded last night on the beach and we are currently working her up. We worked her up this morning and got blood and collected a blowhole sample to check her lungs out and got a gastric sample to see what um, her stomach looks like and currently waiting for a fecal sample to come out. And so we will run tests and, and see everything that's going on with her. So where was this dolphin found? It was, it was stranded off of Thomas Drive in Panama City Beach. Okay, and now you mentioned that uh, you were doing a workup of this dolphin. So mm -hmm. what exactly do you do medically um, when a stranded dolphin comes in? So when a, a stranded animal comes in, we know nothing about what's going on. We just know that they are so sick that they have opted to beach themselves uh, on the beach instead of drowning because that is their, their only way of preventing themselves from drowning. They know that they are weak and they can't keep themselves up. And so when they beach themselves, it's very important to tell people, first of all, don't push them back 
because they've beached for a reason and the more you push them back, the worse they get and, and the, it dwindles their chances of surviving. They already have less than a 5% chance of surviving when they hit the beach. And so that goes down greatly. So when we get them in, we do uh, basic diagnostics. We get blood to see what is going on, what their white blood cells look like, what their, their chemistries, their kidney values, their liver values, all those things look like. And then we get a blowhole sample, which is indicative of the lungs. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a booger sample, uh -huh. um, but that can show us parasites. It can show us if there's bacteria or if there's fungal um, issues going on in the lungs. And then a gastric sample, they have a three chambered stomach. Mm. And so they produce gastric fluids just like you or I, and they are prone to get it, getting ulcers. So we check to see if they have any ulcerations or if they have parasites in their gastric sample. And then finally, when we get a fecal sample, uh, we check and see if they have parasites in their, their GI again. Um, once we kind of get them more stabilized, we'll take chest radiographs, mm. uh, we'll do ultrasounds, a full body, body ultrasound to see what else is going on. And then uh, the other thing with the blood work is we send off for certain tests, for certain viral tests that these dolphins get to make sure there's nothing going on there. So Dr. Staggs, uh, how many people are involved and is this a, a, a 24 hour sort of deal when, when one of these dolphins comes in? It is a 24 hour um, observation slash treatment. It is intensive care, basically. Okay. And so these animals are not left on their own. Sometimes we actually have to be in the water supporting them. With her right now, she's swimming on her own, which we are, are glad we don't have to support her. But um, it takes, depending on what we're doing, it can take a minimum of two people. It can take up to eight people depending on if we're treating them. And you said that g in general, if a dolphin strands itself, that means there's uh, about a 5% chance that they can survive? It, normally when they are straining themselves, they are so sick, they are so close to death that it's hard to get them back to, to health. So the statistics are is that the survival rate is 5% of a stranded, when a stranded live animal hits mm -hmm. the beach. So um, what's, what's gonna be your process with this dolphin um, after you get the lab work back and, and find out more? Well, uh, we've already started her on antibiotics because we know there's some kind of infection going on. Uh, we're just gonna wait for the cultures to then narrow our, our antibiotics down. And then we're gonna deworm her because we've already had some parasites come out. And so these younger animals are so loaded with parasite, it, mm -hmm. it, they can't function, their lungs especially, they get lung worms and they can't breathe the way that they should. So we're gonna kill those so that she can feel a lot better. And then we will treat other symptoms as we, we find them, other problems. So in the wild, is it normal for a dolphin to have parasites? Yes. It is, yes. but just not as many. Not as many. But when they get overwhelmed with parasites, it, it compromises them and so it can kill them. So again, um, your advice to people if they find a stranded dolphin. Call us or call National Marine Fishery Services and they will contact us and we will come out. And even if it's dead, we will come out, we will collect samples, we will remove the animal from the beach. But if it is live, I know a lot of people want to, their natural instinct is to push it back into the, the water, but that actually prolongs their suffering and prevents us from treating them. Now you just mentioned uh, if, a, if a dolphin is found dead on the beach that you still want to know because you're going to take samples. Yes. What samples are you taking and where do those go and what's the reasoning for it? So when an animal strands and it is dead, we do something called a necropsy. People are used to autopsies. A necropsy is what we do for animals and we collect every sample from the body. The process takes about eight hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and we collect samples from the brain, the heart, the lungs, the, the kidneys, all the organs. Um, and then those samples, which of those we divide up, so we're talking about maybe two to 300 smaller subset of samples. Those go to different researchers around the country. Some go to uh, look at the microscopic layers of what's going on with the tissues. Some go for tests, viral tests, some go for bacterial test, again, you just, it, the same thing that they do with people, we want to find out why the animal has passed away. Right now we're in a UME, which is an unusual mortality event, this area. Uh, we've been in that since 2010, which is 
correspondent with the BP oil spill. And so right now we're collecting um, tissue samples to see what is going on. Why are the animals stranding so many at this time still, ten, or five years after the, the oil spill? And has there been any um, hypothesis of why this is happening? The hypothesis is, is that it is linked to the oil spill um, and that somehow there was damage that was done to the environment to these animals and that is why that they are they're stranding at such increased numbers. So when you say that um, our area is seeing increased number of strandings what does that mean number wise? So across the board the UME is from Louisiana to the northern panhandle and the numbers all along Louisiana, Alabama and Mississippi are increased. North um, the northern panhandle right now has not seen a huge increase in numbers. Normally we receive about 15 to 16 strandings per year, except this year we're already on number 15. So we are this year finally seeing an increase in our numbers. But the other states have seen, seen two to three times um, the normal stranding numbers that they would receive before the oil spill. They've been receiving those the whole time. So is there a uh, goal date, um, uh, you know, are there X amount of years before they're able to maybe summarize and finalize the study? It is all up to what the scientists find and discover. There are some papers that are just now coming out, but again, this is all a legal process too uh, because of everything, because this was a man-made disaster, not a natural disaster. So both sets of scientists have to look at it and publish their findings. So it's gonna be a while. The Exxon Valdez spill, I think, took about 15 years before they were able to publish things from that oil spill. You are listening and watching Rap Line here on GC 90.7 FM and GC TV. And my guest today is Dr. Lydia Staggs. She is the staff veterinarian here at Gulf World Marine Institute and Gulf World Marine Park. So. In general, uh, already 15 stranded dolphins this year. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of injuries, ailments are you finding? Some of the animals have what we call a human interaction, uh, findings where they might be entangled with a, a net or a line, a fishing line, or we'll see fishing hooks inside of them that, that they have swallowed. So that is one, but the biggest thing is pneumonia. We find a, we're finding a lot of pneumonia. These animals are susceptible to getting pneumonia because they don't have noses, they have blowholes. So that nose that we have filters out so much and, and they don't have that. So um, that is one of the findings. And then parasites, lots and lots of parasites in their lungs. So what's the treatment for a dolphin with pneumonia and lots of parasites? Antibiotics, because most of the, the pneumonias are bacterial based, and then uh, anti-dewormers, uh, or you know, we make sure that we get rid of the parasites, we kill them. And it's the same uh, medicines that you would give a dog and cat to get rid of their parasites. Gotcha, okay. Yes. And um, as you think along, um, you know, the last year or so that of the different animals coming in, turtles, dolphins, um, you know, is there a, a case that really stands out in your mind that you were um, real happy with to be a part of and the result was very good? Or are there a couple of cases like that? We actually have one that he's still here with us. He, his name, we named him Charlie, um, and he is a turtle. He's a loggerhead turtle that was a boat strike. So a, some, a boat ran over him and the propeller marks, we'll show them to you. You can see where it went through his shell and it actually um, severed his spinal cord. Mm. And this is a severe injury. When he came in, he was covered with barnacles. He actually had maggots growing in, or inside of him. And so I did not give him a very good prognosis. I thought I was gonna have to euthanize him. And he, he had a fighting spirit. Mm -hmm. So he, we treated him and, and I also thought, we would never have to, we would never be able to release him because he was paralyzed in the back end. And a few months later, he started doing better, and then he started moving his flippers. Wow. Which we don't know how. And we did a CT. I thought maybe his, his spine was intact somehow. We did a CT at the local hospital. They were kind enough to, to let us come and use their CT scanner. And we did not see 
a chunk of vertebra. Hmm. And I went, well, that's kind of weird. So then they came back and they let me us come back and do an MRI and it showed that the, the spinal cord was gone in an area, but yet this animal can use its back legs. So hmm. now I am contacting other people and the, I've gotten some of the uh, local doctors at uh, Gulf Coast involved because they're very interested of how this paralyzed animal is suddenly moving its flippers and doing well. And this animal can swim, can, can sink under the water, which it's not supposed to be able to do any of it. And, it, and hopefully in the next uh, month or two, when the shell gets almost completely healed, we'll be able to release Charlie back into the wild. So maybe it sounds like Charlie might even be able to um, help out in maybe, paralyzations, or maybe there's a paper there. Um, this sounds really incredible. It is, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, their nerves and their, their vertebra are built into their shell. And so my theory is, is that maybe the nerve conduction went around and, and has, has through the shell innervated those nerves in the, the back legs. Wow, interesting. Yes. Now, another um, turtle I wanted to ask you about was a turtle named Mahi with three mm -hmm. flippers. Yes. Tell me about Mahi. So Mahi was stranded and went to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center up in, in Georgia and was there for almost two years. Now, this animal was a line entanglement. So a fishing line wrapped around its flipper, cut it off, and was so severe that it had to be amputated. And then it, the remaining area was infected Mm -hmm. and so that they had to treat the bone infection there. And so now uh, Georgia flew Mahi here because they needed a bigger pool. And we have bigger pools, A, for our sea turtles, but also because we do so much with marine mammals, we have pools that are huge for, for dolphins. And so they wanted to make sure that Mahi, since Mahi was in rehab for two years, could swim. So we put Mahi in one of our, our bigger um, dolphin pools he navigates that very well. <laughs> and so he's been here for over a month and we contacted Georgia and said he can feed, he can maneuver, he's swimming with the current, he's, he's avoiding our divers when they go in to clean the pool. And when we have to do medical workup, he's avoiding the divers to <laughs> catch him. And so we think he's ready to go. So on July 7th, we're actually going to release him. It's going to be a, a conjoined release with Georgia Sea Turtle Center over in Jacksonville. Oh, wonderful, okay. St. Augustine, sorry, St. Augustine. So, um, Dr. Staggs, what do you think our listeners and viewers might find surprising about your work here as a veterinarian? It is, everybody says, oh, you've got the best job in the world, and I do. I love being a veterinarian, but the thing they don't realize, it is very hard mm -hmm. and very difficult. Um, we constantly, it's, it's a constant challenge, uh, something that they are now worried about with veterinarians is something called compassion fatigue. It is a, a huge thing that is coming to limelight where veterinarians and, and animal care staff, we are inundated with animals being sick, mm -hmm. animals dying. Um, we now have animal rights activists who are constantly accusing us of, of doing wrong to animals and, and tearing us down publicly, coming after us privately. Uh, in social media and basically bullying mm -hmm. and so that has become a huge problem because it wears on a, a person. We love these animals. We get attached to them. These are uh, in some cases our children, people who don't have human children. This is, this is their lives. This is their livelihood. So the emotional toll that it takes on us is, is very, very deep and that's something that I worry about the staff with, we, you, you have to get away, you have to separate yourself. So that is one thing I want people to realize is that, hey, we're people, mm -hmm. um, we have emotions, but we care so deeply for these animals and we know people care about these animals and we're glad, we, we want them to love these animals just as much, but we're, we're also trying the best we can. We're, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. Um, you can't prevent death, it's always gonna happen but we give the best care to all animals across the board. We wouldn't do this if we didn't love them. And uh, I wouldn't do this if I didn't know that they were receiving the best care. And, and um, so that is something I, I want everyone to know is that they are receiving the top of the line. They, they receive better health care than most humans do. Um, and they are given everything that they could ask for 
or, or want or need. And so they, they are thriving here. And the ones, the, the stranded animals, we release as many as we can back into the wild. There are, there are some that we cannot release. There are very good reasons because they will die if we do. Um, and we give them homes because they need to be taken care of and it is our responsibility to take care of the animals that in some cases are injured because humans did something badly, you know, and, and they got entangled with a line or they were affected by a chemical or something that a human being dropped in. Um, and so it is our responsibility to take care of those animals. And you touched on something that I wanted to ask you about is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you mentioned that so many of these animals that you're treating, um, they have um, fishing line or, or in the case of the one turtle, Charlie, he was run over by a boat. Mm -hmm. So what kind of advice do you have for boaters and, and other people out there that are um, coming in contact with turtles and dolphins? Well, we, sh we share. The, the world and the environment, and especially the, the, I care about all the earth, but the water is my passion. And so boaters, you know, no wake zones, don't go rushing through, you, you will get there. It will be okay, you take your time, enjoy the beautiful Gulf of Mexico. We live in the, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And then fishermen and, and fishing line, if don't leave it, don't, you know, if, if your line breaks, I know that happens, or if you pull up a turtle, call us, we will come and dehook the turtle for you and bring it in, just don't cut the line and release the animal back, but, but clean up, this is, this is their, their home, and so don't throw that bag overboard or, you know, leave that beer can on the beach, things like that, plastic bags, I pull so many plastic bags. And then the other thing is, is simple things, if you don't live here on the beach, or even if you do, recycle. Uh, um, recycle as much as you can, try not to waste things um, and, and dispose of things, re uh, dispose of your trash responsibly. These are just little things that you can do to help the environment and help the animals out there and make my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> and one other thing, um, we know that it's against the law to feed dolphins in the yes. wild. Um, is that really harmful to them if, if people are feeding them in the wild? Yes, it is very, very harmful. First of all, you teach them to be beggars. You wouldn't feed a bear. Most people would not feed a bear. Most people would not feed um, an alligator. They know it is dangerous, it attracts them. Mm -hmm. Well, they forget about that with dolphins. I think we've done such a good job of showing the, the playful, wonderful side of dolphins that they forget that they're still a predator. So those animals, they can do multiple things. Number one, you teach the, the dolphin to become dependent on a human. Number two, when an animal like a dolphin comes up, they're very smart. They're going to train their calves and their young ones to also come up um, and, and become what we call beggar dolphins. And then they come up to an, a person, say some people are swimming and they come up and they're begging, they don't get food. They then can turn on those people and injure them because they get angry and they get aggressive. Um, so again, it's teaching them bad habits. And then the other thing is, is the fish that we feed them is not good. It's bait fish that's been sitting there. There's some bacteria that's on those fish that can kill a dolphin. And so that will also kill a dolphin. And then here's the other thing, and it's really sad. There are people that are malicious. Mm -hmm. And so they will feed dolphins. They know beggar dolphins that they'll feed them things like hooks or mm -hmm. firecrackers. I've seen an animal that had an ex it exploded because they were fed a firecracker and it exploded in their stomach and it killed the animal. These are things, it's horrible, but they will do that. The other thing is that the, I have dolphins that we have rehabbed and one that, we, that came into our um, collection that was shot. Mm. Was, whether it was because they took fish off of a fisherman, and, and you're hurting the fishermen too, because they are trying to make a livelihood, and so you teach these animals to, to steal the fish, and therefore they're gonna steal a fisherman's fish, and then that fisherman can't make a livelihood. So, I mean, it's a vicious cycle by feeding dolphins. Well, thank you very much You're for welcome. all the info. And uh, again, if you want to uh, contribute to the Institute and the rehab portion here, you can do that as well uh, when you come into the park or go on their website as well. Dr. Staggs, thank thanks you. so much for your time talking to us. Thank you. And that is a wrap for this edition of Wrap Line on location here at Gulf World Marine Institute on Panama City Beach. And a reminder, if you are thinking of adding a pet to your family, consider
consider the adoption option, you can always check out our Pet of the Week on our Facebook page. For GC 90.7 FM and GCTV, I'm Emily Blaze. Thanks for listening and watching, and have a great day.